And now for the final talk of the day, we have our honoured guest, Murray, who's not only the honoured guest, but incidentally my old PhD supervisor. Murray. Well, it gives me very great pleasure that so many distinguished colleagues, many of you old friends, have gathered here for a conference associated with my near centennial, <laughs> reaching the age of four score years. It's a great pleasure to see all of you and to listen to what you have to say. Uh, I've been asked to make some remarks, too. And I thought hard about what would be appropriate, and I decided not to present a paper on some of the scientific research that I'm carrying out, but rather to mention a few of the things that I think I have learned about doing research in theoretical science, things I wish somebody had explained to me around 60 years ago. The one I should like to emphasize particularly, the first one, has to do with the frequently encountered need to go against certain received ideas. Sometimes these ideas are taken for granted all over the world. Or sometimes they prevail only in some broad region or in certain institutions. Often they have a negative character. They amount to prohibitions of thinking along certain lines. You must not think in such and such a way. And. Uh, now, we know that most challenges to scientific orthodoxy are wrong, and many are crank. So while what we're talking about here is the need occasionally to ask, why not? Actually, usually, there's a damn good reason why not, but not always. And every once in a while, uh, there's a generally accepted, received idea that prevents you from thinking in a certain way, and that's the right way to think. <laughs> You're forbidden to do the right thing. So it's worthwhile to look around and see whether there is some such received idea that's blocking progress, uh, one that's uh, a prohibition that's not justified. Uh, let me uh, digress to describe something that happened to me a few years ago. I was asked by a big corporation to appear in a television ad for them. And I didn't have to say anything about the corporation. I didn't have to praise it or mention it even. All I had to do was to say that occasionally it's important to ask why not. <laughs> that was the whole commercial. And they paid quite a reasonable sum for this. And. Uh, it was, uh, then they wanted to run it for a second year, which meant they had to pay me the fee all over again by the rules of uh, uh, actors' equity. And uh, they also had to give me a second year's subscription to the Screen Actors Guild. <laughs> uh, and then they liked all this so much that they invited me to their corporate headquarters uh, where I should give a, but wanted me to give a speech on asking why not. <laughs> and uh, it was connected by their intranet to all their facilities all over the world so that their employees could listen at whatever peculiar hour it was, their time, to this talk. Uh, and so I said what you would expect me to say, that uh, I'm a scientist, and in science, every once in a while, it's worthwhile to ask why not. And usually the answer is, there's a damn good reason why not, but not always. And uh, I said, I don't know much about business, but I assume the same is true about business, that uh, there's certain things that uh, just are uh, fixed characteristics. Uh, and so usually there's a damn good reason why not. For example, I said, I imagine that in business there are always questions of profit and loss. And there are always questions of legal and ethical considerations. 
What was the name of the company? Enron. <laughs> I just happened to pick on those two things, profit and loss, <laughs> and legal and ethical considerations. Anyway, uh, so I thought I would start with that kind of thing. Uh, so now and then, sometimes, the only way to make progress is to challenge one of these prohibitions that are uncritically accepted without good reason. But you have to check that it really is without good reason. Most of us remember how, until recently, gastric ulcers were attributed mostly to stress. For example, stress caused by a tyrannical boss. <laughs> Hollywood moguls were quoted as boasting I don't get ulcers, I give ulcers. <laughs> Occasionally, a physician got good results treating ulcers with antibiotics. But that work was generally ignored because everyone knew, in quotation marks, that the primary cause was stress. Finally, a brave Australian doctor gave himself ulcers by swallowing a preparation of the bacterium Helicobacter pylori and uh, the received idea was defeated. Another famous example in, from medicine has to do with Semmelweis in mid-19th century Budapest. He saw large numbers of mothers and newborn babies dying of puerperal fever. He correctly attributed that to the failure of doctors and other health workers to wash their hands properly. Not only was Semmelweis running afoul of a received idea, he was also insulting the medical profession. But think how many mothers and babies died unnecessarily because his correct observation was ignored. Years later, Lister finally gained acceptance for the idea of cleanliness in surgical and obstetric practice, washing everything in sight with carbolic acid. And then he became Lord Lister. From uh, archaeology, we can take the example of non-calendrical Maya glyphs. Uh, the calendrical ones, including those referring to the apparent motions of the sun and the moon and the planet Venus, uh, were deciphered around a century ago. But the other glyphs weren't. What were they? Well, the boss of Maya archaeology was Sir J. Eric S. Thompson. And he proclaimed that they were not writing. Didn't say what they were, but they were not writing. And uh, it was dangerous to disagree with him because he was really the boss of Maya archaeology. But in fact, writing was the correct answer. It took many years for that writing to be deciphered. An important role was played by Yuri Knorozov in, the, in Soviet Russia, a scholar who lived outside the sphere of influence of uh, Thompson. I noted that sometimes a negative received idea is restricted to a region. For example, it was mainly in the United States of America that geologists were forbidden to take continental drift seriously for 50 years. Shortly after I joined the Caltech faculty in 1955, some time ago, I was entering the lunchroom at the Athenaeum, our faculty club, when I spotted a round table full of geologists. I was invited to join them, but only if I promised not to mention continental drift, <laughs> which they knew was all wrong. In fact, if I remember correctly, out of all of them, it was only Heinz Löwenstamm, an immigrant from Europe, who believed in continental drift. All the American educated geologists did not. The physicists at Caltech invited Patrick Blackett and Teddy Bullard to give colloquia at which each one presented strong evidence, different kinds of evidence, uh, for uh, continental drift. Uh, the geologists attended, but most of them left shaking their heads at the naivete of the physicists, believing Blackett and Bullard when, of course, everybody knew that continental drift was a lot of rot. Now, why did they think it was a lot of rot? They may, were making a logical error that we have to watch out for. The logical error was that the, there were, had been many models put forward explaining continental drift. 
And those models were quite wrong. They were easily proved to be wrong. But that didn't mean that the phenomenon of continental drift was wrong, <laughs> only that the attempts to explain it were wrong. <laughs> and uh, when seafloor spreading and plate tectonics came along in the early 60s, uh, American geologists had to change their minds. Except, I am told, at Harvard, where drift was denied for another decade or so. Another table at the Athenaeum, another lunch table, held the cosmologists and nuclear physicists who were working on nucleogenesis in stars. They'd been led to that work by the ideas of Fred Hoyle on continuous creation as opposed to an evolutionary cosmology. Continuous creation had an interesting history. As many of you know, it was suggested by Herman Bondy and Tommy Gold to resolve the problem of the Earth's being apparently older than the universe. That wasn't nice. And people felt there was something wrong if the Earth was older than the universe. The puzzle had, was solved, though, by recalibrating the yardstick for galactic distances. A lot had to do with interstellar, uh, intergalactic material. So as soon as the puzzle was solved and the Earth was now younger than the universe, uh, continuous creation should have been shelved. And some of us actually said so. But uh, it wasn't. It was taken up by Fred. Uh, and Fred made it very popular. Uh, many people joined him in favoring this continuous creation for which there was no reason. It ruled out the genesis of nuclei in the early universe because there was no early universe for Fred Hoyle and his followers. And that led these very people, uh, Willie Fowler, the Burbages, and so on, to brilliant work on nucleogenesis in stars. They were led to it by the continuous creation idea, which got rid of the early universe so the they had to find some other place to make nuclei. However, the problem showed up when they couldn't account for the very light elements through nucleogenesis in stars. They actually asked me what to do about it. I said, well, uh, you know perfectly well that alpha and gamma uh, sh showed how the light elements would have been created in the early universe. They said, but Fred says there was no early universe. <laughs> as you know, in that paper, the authors appeared not as Alpha and Gamow, but as Alpha, Beta, and Gamow. <laughs> a stunt by Gamow. Thought it would be a lot of fun to have it sound like Alpha, Beta, and Gamma. Although Beta had nothing to do with the letter. Anyway, uh, I should mention that Willie Fowler went to the trouble of acknowledging graciously years later that he should have paid attention <laughs> to what I was saying. We need hardly bring up the obvious examples here of Copernicus and Galileo challenging the heliocentric idea that was a similar uh, challenge to a received, received idea. But the cases we've been reviewing here, from medicine, from archaeology, from physics, from astronomy, are very important ones. And it sometimes it may be hard for any of us to conclude that a similar situation is occurring in our own much more modest work. Uh, we could think that this challenging of a received idea is something that's reserved for great people on great occasions, uh, very important situations, and so on. But in fact, in our regular work, we may run into it at any time. And it's worth checking out the various received ideas to see whether they really have a basis in, uh, in uh, uh, whether they really have a, a serious reason to exist. So on this Modest level, 
I've run into received ideas in my own work. For example, in working out the notion of strangeness back in 1952, I had to contradict the received idea that half integral spin for particles implied half integral isospin. And integral spin implied integral isospin. And I actually had to check and make sure that there really wasn't any reason for uh, a particle of integral isospin to have, not to have uh, half integral spin and so on. Uh, then the physical review letters wasn't happy and I had to convince them that this was all right. Uh, the physical review letters wasn't happy about something else. I had the K naught meson uh, distinct from the K naught bar meson. The K naught formed a doublet with K plus, an isotopic doublet with K plus, and the K naught bar formed an isotopic doublet with K minus, and uh, they were not the same, K naught and K naught bar. Uh, they said, this is very bad. Scalar mesons that are not their own antiparticles, uh, that's, not, that's not good. Something is the matter with that. Well, that previous summer, I had uh, visited uh, England, visited England and the rest of Europe for the first time, actually. And uh, in Cambridge, I met Nick Kemmer. Nick Kemmer was of Russian origin, uh, but spoke uh, perfect English, beautiful English. He was uh, a, a man who took Dirac's students and actually taught them something. <laughs> and uh, very nice fellow. Anyway, I met him and I discovered that he had written a paper on uh, mesons with isotopic spin. Uh, a triplet, just like pi plus, pi zero, and pi minus uh, as were subsequently discovered. Now, the description of a neutral meson, was, a spin, neutral spin zero particle, was uh, handled as follows. They took the pauli weisskopf theory of scalar mesons, charged scalar mesons, plus and minus, and they took away the charge. Then they had neutral scalar mesons. But they had the neutral scalar meson, which was not its own antiparticle, because it was descended from a, K from, from a positive meson from which they'd taken away the charge. And the other one was a negative meson from which they'd taken away the charge. So they were not their own antiparticles. Kemmer, however, was dealing with something like what was later called the pi naught. This was in 1937, I think, uh, th 39 at the latest. And uh, so he had to convince people that it was okay to have the uh, neutral meson and its antiparticle be the same thing. <laughs> and finally, people agreed with that, and his paper was published. And I was running into trouble with the physical review letters <laughs> for the opposite reason. <laughs> <laughs> Those of us who like quarks uh, got into trouble with at least three received ideas. The neutron and proton are elementary and they are not made of simpler things. They are known to be elementary. Second, elementary particles do not have fractional electric charges in units of the proton charge. And elementary particles are not confined inside objects like the neutron and proton, unable to emerge singly or to be used in industry. They couldn't possibly be like that. Confined mathematical quarks, nothing like that is possible. So we had to overcome these three ideas. We had to check that there really was no need for any of these prohibitions. They sound plausible, but they're not. They're not necessary. 
So it's useful to check out a lot of negative received ideas that are relevant just to make sure that they are uh, really justified. Uh, in uh, 1964, or maybe it was even late 63, no, it was probably in 63, I was uh, at my, in my office at Caltech talking on the telephone to Vicky Weisskopf, my teacher. But we weren't talking directly about physics. We were both on some international committee to discuss future accelerators. And uh, we were discussing that uh, on the phone. And at a pause in the conversation, I said, by the way, Vicky, I think there may be some evidence that neutrons and protons are made of each of three things with fractional charges. And he said, Murray, stop it. This is a transatlantic call. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, he could have asked George, who was at CERN, <laughs> a, few, a few offices away. But he didn't do that either. And I didn't know about that work either, about the ACEs. <clears throat> Let me mention, if there's time, is there time? Who's the, where's the chairman? Yeah, okay. Let me mention a couple of other things besides challenging, uh, oh no, un unnecessary prohibition. So wait, first I want to give one more. I, I really should give one more example of prohibitions. Nowadays, I do some work uh, with a team of bright, mostly Russian linguists. They are professional linguists and they know what they're doing and I'm just an amateur, but I'm very interested in the subject as many of you know. And so I, help to coordinate this project and get money for it and so on. And uh, what these people do is to study distant relationships among human languages involving bigger and older groupings than the generally accepted ones like Indo-European or Uralic or uh, Austronesian. Virtually all this work is rejected by most, quote, mainstream historical linguists in Western Europe and in the United States. In, in Russia, it's tolerated, and in the Czech Republic, it's tolerated. But uh, in the West, it's not. Now, these uh, mainstream linguists impose a huge burden of proof on anyone who suggests a distant genealogical relationship, preferring to resort for explanations to borrowing of words, or chance, or onomatopoeia leading to invention of similar words in different places independently because of some natural sound. And they will use these explanations no matter how unlikely these alternatives appear, as long as they're not arguing for relationship. It's as if it were some kind of a crime to claim genealogical relationship. You have to go to enormous lengths to justify what you're doing if, if you claim that. So are we dealing here with another of those doomed received ideas? I, I would guess so, but uh, of course, it's hard to be sure. Another lesson I've learned besides looking out for uh, these unnecessary prohibitions, another lesson is that it's sometimes very important to distinguish ideas that are to apply to today's problems from those that will be useful in the context of tomorrow's deeper problems. I can think of two cases from my own research. One has to do with introducing charm for the hadrons so as to make two doublets, uh, up and down and charmed and strange. And correspondingly, two neutrinos for the electron and the muon that makes two weak doublets. Why was I slow in embracing this picture for the quarks? For the neutrinos, uh, together with Dick Feynman, I had worked out that the uh, prohibition of uh, mu muon decay into electron plus photon required two neutrinos. So that was not a surprise for me, and it's not something I particularly resisted. But the parallel construction of the four quark flavors, I resisted for some time. I didn't accept charm right at the beginning. 
Why was I slow in embracing it? I knew that the weak angle of around 15 degrees between the strangeness changing and the strangeness preserving parts of the weak current worked well, reinforcing the idea of weak doublets for the leptons and for the quarks. What was the matter? The matter is that I wanted the electric charge operator to be a generator of a simple or at least a semi-simple group, not an extra, not with an extra U1 factor in the symmetry group. That meant that the sum of the charges of the elementary particles had to be zero. Well, with the, uh, without charm, uh, it worked fine. Uh, for, the, uh, for the quarks. Two-thirds minus a third minus a third is zero. But if you add in another two-thirds for charm, it's not zero anymore. So I was a little worried about charm for that reason. I obviously wasn't thinking very clearly because uh, we needed doublets in order to accommodate the weak charges. But I was stupidly thinking in terms of the immediate problem of finding the right hadron theory, not the long range problem of the theory of hadrons and leptons together. If you put the hadrons and the leptons together in some kind of unified scheme, we don't know yet whether that's right, but uh, subsequently it was discussed a lot, it has been discussed for decades now. If you do that, you get for all of the particles, three times two-thirds minus a third plus two-thirds minus a third minus one minus one, and that's zero. You put together the quarks and the leptons, the charges all sum to zero. So I wasn't carefully distinguishing to ideas to be useful today from ideas that would be useful tomorrow. And uh, I think that's a mistake that it's easy to make. Another occasion when I should have distinguished ideas to, for today from ideas that might be useful tomorrow was came about when Harold and I had been thinking about a Yang-Mills theory of color SU3 coupled to quarks, what was later called QCD. I talked about it at the 1972 Rochester meeting in Chicago with David Gross, another QCD pioneer, in the chair. I was quite enthusiastic, but in the written version of the talk, I was much more tentative and uh, gave a very brief description of this idea. Why was I tentative? The main reason was that I was learning about string theory, which was being discussed in the room next to mine at CERN. And I wondered whether some kind of colored strings might be involved somehow. And of course, we know, and we heard today, that uh, in QCD, there is a string-like effect for the gluon field. And the MIT bag model was an approximate description of such a thing. But these things actually come out of uh, QCD. You don't need to introduce strings directly uh, in discussing hadrons. Strings, however, might be useful, superstrings, uh, for a unified theory. That's another different matter. It's unified theory including gravitation, perhaps. Or at least they might point the way toward a unified theory that includes gravitation. So again, I was not distinguishing uh, ideas that would be useful today from ideas that might be useful tomorrow. The final lesson I would like to draw from this experience of 60 years of theorizing uh, is to, is this, doubt and messiness and hesitation are inevitable. Tolerate them, even embrace them. I read the new biography of Dirac by Graham Farmelo. Despite a few errors, it's an excellent book. I was delighted, by the way, to find that two of the anecdotes in it came from me. Uh, I was fascinated by the accounts of the great theoretical physicists of the 20s, 30s, and 40s of the last century, many of whom I got to know later. What struck me particularly was the messiness of the process of figuring out 
quantum mechanics, atomic and nuclear physics, quantum electrodynamics, and so on and so on. Those great scientists had doubts and changed their minds and changed them back again and argued and made mistakes and got confused. It was very messy. And I'm beginning to think that it's just inevitable that things go that way, and we might as well uh, accept that we live in an intellectual world where that kind of thing uh, happens. One of the anecdotes that Farmalo got from me for his book on Dirac was about my asking him, uh, Paul Adrian, why didn't you simply predict the positron? As you know, he toyed for a while with the idea that the proton was the hole in the sea, even though the mass is 2,000 times greater. And uh, many people didn't believe in his theory, his equation, or positrons, or anything because of that. Uh, finally, he adopted the position that there, should, that there should be a positron. But he didn't make that a real prediction. So I asked him, why didn't you just predict the positron? And he said, cowardice, pure cowardice. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this has nothing to do with this talk, but I asked him another question, and I think that, appears, yes, that appears in Farmelow's book too, I believe. Uh, I was giving some lectures in Cambridge in 1966, and uh, the lectures were mainly about quarks. And Dirac slept through every lecture, as he always did. And as he always did, he woke up and asked extremely penetrating questions. Uh, so I asked, but I noticed that he really liked the quark idea. It was clear from his questions that he was very enthusiastic about the idea. So I asked him, uh, how come you like quarks? Most people think it's crazy. He said, oh. Uh, they do have spin one half. <laughs> I, has, I suffered for many decades from the belief, the terribly ba but dangerous belief, that when hesitating between alternatives, I had to choose the correct one. I just described a, minute, a few minutes ago one or two of those cases. Ljova Okun once quoted to me advice he had received from an older colleague. Publish your idea along with the objections to it. <laughs> that would have been a good thing for me to know. I would now add, publish the two contradictory ideas along with their consequences and choose later. <laughs> Apparently, the messiness of the process is inevitable. Instead of suffering while trying to make it perfectly clean and neat, why not embrace the messiness and enjoy it? Thank you. day, so perhaps we should uh, spare Professor Gilman questions now, and uh, because the dinner is now on uh, available. <laughs>